time once again for Community Forum. And we're very lucky to have back with us live in the studios this morning, Jim Waddell. Jim Waddell is a retired civil engineer with 35 years of public service with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. In 1999, he became the deputy district engineer at the Walla Walla District, which operates the four dams on the Lower Snake River in eastern Washington. At that time, the Corps was completing the final draft of an environmental impact statement for the four Snake River dams that would outline the pros and cons of salmon recovery options, including dam removal. And he is here to talk about that study and what has happened since and uh, Jim, thanks uh, very much for coming in and spending time with us again this morning. Well, thanks, Mike. It's good to be back. So, uh, start out. T- tell us, um, tell us a bit about the original EIS and how you got kind of pulled back into this issue because it appeared like you were you were out of it for a while. There, you were you were done with it. Yeah, that's right, Mike. Uh, when I got to Walla Walla, the um, there was this. $33 million study going on. I showed up at about year five and started, um, you know, as a senior civilian in the district, getting into the the details and the economics and the biology and so forth. And um, and so that's where I first became familiar with the subject. And, and in the, that decision process did, in fact, recommend that we continue with breach planning in, because we I felt that was a necessary uh, approach to take. Um, that, of course, was not the decision that was, was finally rendered by the commander, commander and so forth. Um, and so after a couple more years in Walla Walla, um, you know, I moved on to another assignment in the Corps, retired a few, you know, about, uh, oh, about 2009, and moved to Walla Walla. I mean, not Walla Walla, excuse me, to uh, Port Angeles, Washington. And, um, you know, a funny thing happened to me there after a couple of years of uh, being a retiree and so forth and, and, and actually working part time again for the Corps of Engineers as a reappointment authority. I um, was at a symposium on the breaching of the Elwha dams near my hometown, which I didn't know anything about. And so I was sitting there listening to some environmental groups talk about Snake River dams, which surprised me. And um, in that conversation, they said, well, gee, it's a tragedy for uh, salmon and so forth. Agreed. Um, but they said it would take many, many years, 15 years or so, to bridge the dams because they were so viably, economically viable that it would take a long time to overcome that economic resistance. And I knew that wasn't right, and I just had to do something. So I stood up and walked around and, and at a rare moment, grabbed a mic and basically told the moderator that um, – that that wasn't the case, that in fact these dams could be breached and that they were an economic travesty. What I didn't realize is I was being filmed and I ended up in a documentary named Damnation. And so uh, I didn't think much of that at the time, but they came back, interviewed me, and I told them more stories about the, the study and the economics and so forth, and they ended up putting that in the documentary. And then a few years later it came out. Um, once it came out um, and I was asked to go on screenings and so forth, I, you know, I, I said, I better start doing my homework on this. And so I started going back in and rereading the study, which is several thousand pages long, other documents in the government about relating to this and talking to some of my colleagues who were still in the Corps of Engineers and other federal agencies like EPA and so forth, and trying to get the, you know, wh- where are we at on this thing? And it really surprised me that after all those years, nothing had happened It was just being litigated in court, but there was no real action going on breaching the dams. Um, And so, um, but as I got into it, and and over the years, and and like maybe in the last four or five years, I probably spent about 10,000 hours born into this stuff. And and so that's how I'm back into it now, is is I'm, I'm, you know, basically a guy that just said it's the right thing to do to try to figure out what's going on here. Nobody's paying me to do this, and I don't belong to any organizations or represent any organizations. I just felt like since my, I have a big background in the Corps, and I understand the policies and the engineering, um, that um, I might be a, uh, probably the only person that could go back in and try to bring this to light. And so my primary mission, if you will, over the last few years is simply to bring this information to the public, bring it to the policymakers and the elected officials and, and the media and anybody else to point out the, the, um, the basic facts here and that we do have at, and at our disposal a ready-made solution 
for salmon survival, Chinook survival, and also a way of um, providing um, a, a quick fix to the amount of Chinook that the southern resident killer whales, these starving orcas, need. And so um, not only that, but it, it's a way of saving money for ratepayers because these dams are expensive to operate and um, they're wasting our ratepayer money now. So it, it, if you want to save salmon, save orc, and save dams, or save money at the same time, you breach these dams. So that's basically the message that I've been trying to put forth. So let's start out with, uh, because it's in the news currently, let's start out with the situation with the orcas and the Chinook salmon that would be um, freed uh, to be available for, for food for these literally starving, beautiful animals. Right. Well, the southern residents that I think is our people are starting to become aware of are basically Chinook eaters. Most of their diet is Chinook. And historically, um, for thousands of years, part of their Chinook diet came from the uh, mouth of the Columbia River. They would go out in the ocean and intercept those uh, runs that came out of the Snake River in the Columbia. Um, because so much of the Columbia watershed has been dammed off, and, and snake too, but primarily the snake has the best habitat, the most productivity available to it, but it's all being sub-optimized by the loss of juvenile salmon coming across those four dams and then four more Columbia dams. And so that, that loss of salmon, uh, Chinook salmon specifically, out in the ocean is what's one of the key um, dietary deficient um, aspects of these southern resident whales. And so they need these Chinook. Yes, they eat Chinook from the Fraser River and the Salish Sea and Puget Sound and all this kind of stuff. But, um, but an important part of their diet, several months' worth of their diet, did come from the dams, and, I mean, from the Columbian Snake River, and the dams are impeding that uh, flow of food to them. And uh, you were part of a uh, forum at uh, Town Hall Seattle a couple of years ago. There was multiple... It's not just you saying this. You, you are teamed up with numerous uh, experts in our region that focus on these whales. Um, and they literally showed pictures of, um, I mean, emaciated whales. And that was like two years ago. I'd hate to think what it's like, what they're like now. I mean, we get, we've seen in the, in the newspaper th that mother that is literally pushing, I don't know what day it's on. It's like two weeks at least now. That's literally pushing her dead child through the water. Right, Mike, you've accurately described it. And yes, the, I, I'm, I'm not a whale biologist nor a fish biologist, but I go to the experts for this, this, um, it, this information as well as the documentation. Um, Ken Balcom from the Center for Whale Research is a, a, a constant colleague of mine. We talk almost daily now in terms of um, what's going on. And, and he, a long time ago, recognized the source of Chinook into the, um, you know, out of the Snake River as being an important dietary element of these whales. And he's the one that basically clued me in and said, hey, Jim, um, what do you know about these dams and how do you get them breached? And so uh, Ken and I have been trying to tell that story of the, the you know, the role of Chinook, the whales uh, and so forth, their urgency, the fact that they're so few of them left. There's only 75 now. There's been seven deaths over the last few years. No babies have survived in the last few years. Um, and so we're in a very, very precarious situation with the whales, according to Ken. Or I think any observer can see this, is that, it, you know, when you're down to a population of 75 total whales, and a very small fraction of that, maybe, you know, 15 or so, 20 of them, I don't know the exact number, but... Uh, of, of a breeding population, the ones that could breed. And, and there's an even smaller number that are actually breeding. And of course, none of them have had a, none of the females have had a, um, a, a baby that survived. And um, the one that, uh, that recently died was only alive for 30 minutes before she died. So, and you, uh, again, along with your peers, have figured out that uh, breaching these four dams and, and with your... You can go into details on this with your plan. You wouldn't even necessarily breach them all immediately. We're talking about there is a plan in place where bringing down two years ago, it was just one. But now you, because of the urgency, it appears you need to take out two of the lower dams. Can you talk about that? Sure. Um, the, um, the plan, the most cost effective plan for breaching that the Corps had and that we looked at was to breach one dam per year. However, the biology is, is pretty clear now that, it, yeah, that would have been fine if we just started breaching two or three years ago, but here we are in 2018 and still no progress. And so in order to get 
um, um, a reasonable bang for your buck in terms of salmon returns, you need to breach the first two dams this year. And because what that does is each one of these dams and the reservoirs, the reservoirs are big killers of juvenile fish, the juvenile salmon that come down the river. Um, each one of these dams kills about 10% of the juveniles that go across. Well, right now, roughly 20 million Chinook are go through the lower, um, Colum uh, lower Snake River. And so if you do the math there, and this is pretty simple stuff, it doesn't take a lot of modeling to figure this out, is that you're going to kill 2 million salmon per dam and reservoir. And so while half those won't make it past the other dam, still you get a million or so smolts out in the ocean. So if you take out two dams, you get 2 million smolts out in the ocean. Um, and within about 14, 15, 16 months, there'll be size big enough for um, uh, orchid eat and also for fishermen to start taking. And so that, that is the quickest solution. Um, there's very few other things that you could possibly do that would have that kind of impact other than immediately ceasing all commercial and sport fishing, which is not a very popular idea in the state of Washington. And so, um, but this is one that um, can be done quickly and it can be done at no expense to the state of Washington. It's all federal and Bonneville powers, um, uh, authorities and monies and so forth. So that that is what we, uh, not it's not what we see, it's what the government, in fact, documentation shows and, and the situation calls for. So, uh, so what would be the cost? Do you, I mean, do you know what the costs would be for the federal government and for Bonneville for doing that? Are there estimates for that? Sure. We have a total cost for all four dams of around $340 million to breach, which is roughly what it costs to breach the two Elwha dams. The, um, um, but uh, what's, uh, the first dam to be breached actually can be breached for less than $40 million. The first two dams, um, about $40 million apiece. They're, they're very simple to breach. They have uh, large earthen berms in them. And so just by, basically by notching the berms as you start drawing down the reservoirs, over the span of a few weeks, you can then um, notch a, put a notch in them and then let the water about halfway down, you, you uh, conduct what we call a controlled hydraulic breach where you carefully let the water through the notch and let it erode away the rest of the earth and berm and all, and voila. Uh, within 48 hours, you've got a free flowing river again, you know, once you start that breach. Um, so that, that's the, the simplicity of it. The, um, the engineering is, there's no engineering to it to speak of. And so, and cost-wise, it's, it's not that much. So, um, and policy-wise, it's, it's all capable of being done now. And what I found fascinating uh, when I first heard about this a couple of years ago is actually economically, um, not, not even if we just took the whole, you know, salmon equation out of this and, and the orcas, economically it even makes sense to do this. Is that correct? Mike, that's correct. And, and here's what people, very few people know, is that these dams have always been a problem economically. They were never economically justified um, back in the 30s when the Corps looked at them. But in 1947, they added some bogus um, benefits to the equation, including hydropower, to justify them economically. But as you know, if you start off with a bad project, it doesn't get better with age. And so these four dams have always been a nuisance in terms of economic viability for the Corps of Engineers. When we did the study back in 2000, and it was finalized in 2002, it was you know, pretty clear, although like most government documents, you really had to tease it out of the document to realize that the economics just weren't there. And today what we see, it's even worse, here we are, 18 years later, and um, things like hydropower have totally flipped in terms of their value. And, and this is the biggest problem that most people don't realize is the hydropower situation. Um, the state of Washington, Pacific Northwest, basically is um, flood, flooded is a funny word for hydropower, but we, we have a massive oversupply of hydropower. And while that worked for many years because we were selling that oversupply or surplus to California and making enough money for Bonneville Power to reasonably keep our rates, you know, in check and to pay for some fish mitigation, what's happened in California is that they've gone to far more wind. Uh, they've got, they've added 9,000 megawatts of solar in the last six years. And so this is cut deeply into those surplus sales. And so what's happened now is instead of selling that, that power at the 
cost of production, which these days is about $36 a megawatt hour, um, Bonneville is having, having to sell it at most of the times at a loss. About the only time they're making money on it is during the daytime. This time of year, they're making maybe um, 30 or $40 a megawatt hour on a really good day. But the rest of the year, they're losing money. And that loss goes back to the rate payers. And so that's, a, that's why Bonneville has now said they're in dire financial straits. And in fact, the uh, administrator of Bonneville, Elliot Meinzer, stated public in March that while he's not ready to panic, he's very, very significantly close to it and, and admitting that now we have to do something. And, and, you know, when you're talking about, you know, reducing cost on hydropower, it's not like you can instantly turn off a switch and you're making money. But if you breach, start breaching the lower snake dams now, not only does this take care of the salmon issue, but this uh, represents a, 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 a significant cost savings for Bonneville because the lower snake dams are, are not very good producers of hydropower because of the limited amount of water that flows down those rivers, especially this time of year. Those dams have six turbines each. This time of year, there might be one or two running, and so they're they're not performing in the sense like a Grand Coulee Dam or Chief Joseph, which are you know as, as dams go, they're pretty good in terms of delivering hydropower. And so, what we need to be doing is is, is getting rid of these four dams and taking the money we that Bonneville and the Corps saves on those and applying it to the other dams where it's more effective to use this um, hydropower. What about for uh, irrigation purposes? Are the dams used for any of that? Well, there's on one of the dams, there's something called incidental irrigation. In other words, it's some, not something that taxpayers invested in, but it's something that some farmers out there, about 11 or 12 of them, have been um, drawing water off one of the reservoirs. And so what we would want to do as part of our breach plan is to mitigate um, their additional expense for basically extending their pump pipes down into the river because right now they go to a reservoir, so we'd have we drop the reservoir, we'd have to extend the pipes, and that's only going to cost about $18 million. And that's an easy thing to, to pay for as part of the breach. Um, the other one is uh, the shipment of grain on, by barging. Um, in the last 15 years, most of the rail lines in the area have been upgraded. Farmers have shifted to more um, uh, rail shipments. They built their own unit train loaders to load grain efficiently. They're building another one. Um, so this is taking traffic off the river for grain. Um, there's nothing else virtually that's shipped on the river. Um, and the what's left can easily be put, put back onto rail. There's, there's rail facilities going up and down the river. They've been upgraded. Um, there's a couple small rail lines in the, um, um, with the Port of Columbia that those need to be upgraded, and that's a, that's a, a dollar amount. We know $29 million to upgrade those rail lines, and so that, too, would be part of the mitigation plan. And then a few extra bucks to um, increase some or improve some lines up uh, about five miles or two miles of line up in Idaho. But that's pretty simple stuff. And when you compare it to, you know, you know mitigating for that versus um, – you know, the state of Washington trying to invest $10 million in hatchery production each year to try to um, increase hatchery production to, for, to create Chinook, and that's a $10 million a year. I mean, that doesn't go away. You have to keep it up. So when you compare it, you can see that, well, wait a minute. We, economically speaking, it looks like a, it is a far better deal to go ahead and get rid of these four dams and save the money, we wouldn't need to spend $10 million on hatchery fish because we'd be saving 2 million fish just by simply eliminating two dams. And when you go to four dams, which you really need to get rid of, then you've got 4 million more fish out in the ocean, you know, to, for fishermen and um, uh, orcas that will grow into at some point for them. And aren't the, the wild fish more robust than hatchery fish? Yes, that's generally true. Um, it, on the Snake River, that's particularly true. But with, but the the wild fish are in trouble here. Um, they're in serious decline and have been, and they represent only about fifteen or twenty percent of the total amount of fish. The rest are hatchery fish. But what's been going on over the last twenty or thirty years since we started using so many hatchery fish is that the um, this has led to a genetic decline of the wild genes and the wild fish and also in the hatchery fish. And so what's happening is these fish become um, less resilient. They become smaller. 
um, and they're not surviving as well because their genetic material is being diluted. They're, they're becoming domesticated, frankly, um, because the hatchery fish are interbreeding with them and so forth like this. And so um, while uh, hatchery fish um, traditionally were in, uh, the strongest and still are to some degree, that, that effect is being ameliorated by this uh, saturation of hatchery fish and the dilution of genes in the population. It, doesn't the removal of the dams also free up a bunch of uh, prime agricultural land, too? Yes, it does. This is something that um, uh, most people don't realize. The, the Corps of Engineers didn't study it when we did this study. But when you breach the dams, you free up 140 miles of river that's now underwater. Um, back in the days before the dams, that was about 10,000 acres of agriculture. Some uh, Washington's, some of its original viticulture land was in that valley and then orchards and so forth. It's a very um, robust uh, agricultural community along there. And, of course, the tribes were there, and, did, and they were active and fishing and had villages and everything, and it was, um, it was um, a pretty decent lifestyle for those folks. Now, you get, a lot of, you, get a, you get all that land back, of course, with breaching, and it looks like it would be easy to put back about 5,000 acres of that agriculture um, in order to and save the other 5,000 for riparian areas and habitat areas for um, the salmon and so forth. So uh, talk a little bit about the state is currently having a series of meetings with a task force uh, regarding the local killer whale southern pods. Am I getting that right? And, um, and you have gone to several of those. And uh, what is what is the focus? What is your feedback on what's happening with those? Because that would seem to be like a, a reasonable place to leverage these potential changes. Yes, the Governor Inslee, um, largely at the prodding of uh, people like Ken Balcom and some stuff I was pointing out to the Puget Sound Partnership, established a uh, an ORCA task force um, in oh, several months ago, and its purpose was to address the urgency, the imminent situation that these whales are facing in terms of how do we recover them, how do we save them, how do we keep them from going extinct. Um, I've been, they've had three task force meetings so far. I'm not a member of the task force, uh, um, uh, but I do go as a public citizen and I comment, I take, I get my two minutes at the mic, like, you know, anybody else. And, um, and if, if spoken up about, um, my, my role is simply to inform them that breaching is a very feasible opportun op uh, opportunity and it doesn't take years. It can be done immediately. It can be done. In fact, it can be done as soon as this December. Um, that's a hard pill for them to swallow. They're mostly focused on um, everything else you can imagine, uh, from reducing vessel traffic and vessel noise to uh, restricting fishing to um, creating more hatchery fish, putting more spillover dams, creating more habitat. And while all this stuff, except maybe that spill is not a good investment, but the rest of it is, is fine. But if you don't immediately get some salmon back into the ocean for those orcas, and the only way you can do that quickly, quick enough, is with breaching the Snake River dams. And so um, the task force has been reluctant to get into that. They've, they've skipped it the first two meetings, haven't really talked about it. Governor Inslee put it on the table um, uh, Friday a week ago and said, hey, I want the task force to look at Snake River Dam breaching. Um, and, but still, it, it's, 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 it's like uh, it's, you're not allowed to talk about it, but base, we barely have got it on the table now. Um, I, I testified and threw down the EIS and pounded it on the table and said, here it is, here it is, here it is. And um, to say, we've got all this stuff. We've got the science. We've got, we know what the economics are. And we've got the policies that allow to allow this to happen right away. And so, um, but I think what the, the task force is still stuck in this world of all these existing programs and projects that they've looked at for years and years and years. And, and most of them, like I said, are fine, but they will take years to come around. And so while they would be helpful if you don't breach the Snake River dams, that stuff is, generally speaking, a waste of money. You're, we're, we're, we're wasting our money if we're going to um, be investing in habitat that there's there's no fish left to come back to it. And while these task forces and blue endless blue ribbon panels uh, are put together, again we've got orcas that are literally dying as we speak. 
That's correct, and, uh, and I'm afraid that's the urgency, and I, I think that's the thing the public um, really needs to understand and appreciate that um, we can't solve this with paper. Um, there, there's, we have all the studies we need. We have all the information we need. The evidence is right in front of us, whether you're looking at the science or the dead whales and the lack of, of Chinook salmon or any kind of salmon. And so what the public needs to realize is that the government has the means at hand now to do something. And yet they are uh, they're somehow in the belief that the public doesn't want these dams breached. It's, it's some sort of mandate that uh, in the mind of the Pacific Northwest person that we've got to have these dams. It's almost like the, the greatest manifest uh, evidence of manifest destiny is these dams. And so unless the people of Washington want to um, uh, convert to the ever dam state instead of the ever green state, we're going to have to rise up and, 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 and get to our politicians, our elected officials like Governor Inslee and Senator Murray and Senator Cantwell, and, and press on them. And yes, a lot of folks have been doing that, but it's not, it, it hasn't been enough. They're still entrenched. They're still um, believing that they can make deals in, 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 on, in other ways to solve this problem um, by spilling, by doing more studies, by doing another EIS, by relying on a federal judge to tell us something in three or more years or so. Um, but that's not going to work, folks. And so what we really have to do is impress upon our elected officials and the Corps of Engineers and Bonneville Power Administration that this is we, we're holding them accountable and we've got to do this now. And that's not just my, my view. This is simply what the data says. Um, um, it, it's, uh, it's pretty clear. It's, that's the bureaucracy we're dealing with. That's the way government is. The policies are there. And all this stuff's in black and white. It's just that um, people have to realize their role, their civic role here to, to really say something in massive numbers. Not 100 people calling governors into his office, but, you know, the, statistic, the statisticians tell us it takes 1,000 calls a day to make a difference with a politician. So that's what needs to happen. And again, you uh, on your on your uh, the website damsense.org, um, you have uh, a lot of this information. And one of the key things is is that uh, the two dams that need to come down, uh, it needs the it needs to start happening this September. So literally, like a couple weeks from now, is the the first window to possibly save uh, the, the orcas. Exactly. I mean, there's a little paperwork the Corps has to do, a, record, a new record of decision to conform with, uh, you know, environmental laws and so forth, and then a simple contract and so forth. But yes, um, one September in that time frame, the Corps has got to decide to do this and get it rolling because they have to start drawing down the reservoir of the first dam in around the 1st of December so that around the 8th of January, um, they start the actual breach of the hydraulic breach and so that's that's the urgency that's the timeline and if we don't do that it gets pushed off a year because we cannot uh, it's it's not a good idea to breach um any other time except from december to march because that's the time in the in the river where there's very few fish migrating up and down and so the breaching could um, harm fish the sediment and so forth moving down if it was done at any other time of the year than this so we leave lose a full year uh, the scientists, the orca people, the, the Chinook people tell us we can't wait another year. The orcas can't wait another year. And, um, and so that's the urgency. All right. And did I hear correctly either uh, during the interview or before that you have not been able to actually physically uh, meet with either our governor or our two senators at this point, even though you've been trying? Uh, that's correct. I've been trying for several years to meet with um, uh, Senator Murray, Senator Cantwell, uh, Governor Inslee, my own Congressman Kilmer, although finally I will be meeting with him uh, next week with some ORCA folks that finally got his attention. Um, but I've met many times with their staff. I've pr pr provided uh, myself and others have provided thousands of pages of documents and reminded them what the government is, is trying, what the government information says. And so it's not like they shouldn't know, but they are pretending like they don't know. Or it's, it's I don't know, it's, it, you can't tell until you sit down and talk to them. But I am finding when I talk to a senior official like the Corps of Engineers, they're really surprised when I lay out the numbers. And so my impression is that they're not really being fully informed. 
All right. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. So I want to thank you very much for coming and spending time with us again. Thanks, Mike.